we're on we had Elijah um, over at some friends this evening and on the way there on the freeway my wife was calling and leaving a message with my daughter and she said we're starting at 7 30 tonight and I said no we're not starting at 7 30 we're starting at 6 30 so all day long in my mind I incorrectly was planning for two presentations tonight and it's only one so um so, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> then at the meal that we had, we met some new friends. I, I tried to remember their names. I remember his brother Nassib's name, but his wife. I think I remember it, but it's different enough that I'm not going to say it publicly and attend her. But they haven't been to any of the meetings so far, so I'm realizing that um, you know you have the extra task of trying to bring people along the presentation that's been developed over about probably nine or ten presentations. So um, I'm warning you that there's a lot of groundwork that we just can't catch up and maybe the same for some others in here. And Brother Rand can read it back. Um, so if you turn with me to Revelation 10, In Revelation 10, verse 4, it says, well, let's start with verse 3. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roared. And when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Much of the point of reference for these presentations has been in identifying what the seven thunders represent and that they were sealed up and what it means that they were sealed up and what it means when they are unsealed. Um, Sister White identifies for us that the seven thunders represent two specific histories. She says the seven thunders represent a delineation of events that would transpire under the first and second angel's messages, or to put it, in a simple form, it represents the history of 1840 to 1844. But in the same article, in two paragraphs later, she says, the set, the two paragraphs before that, she says, the seven thunders represent future events that will be disclosed in their order. And she wrote this in 1901. So the seven thunders represent the history of the Millerites from 1840 to 1844. And it also represents the history when the 144,000 will be raised up. Um, she doesn't say that directly in this passage, but through the week we took another passage from Spirit of Prophecy, Great Controversy, page 343, where she teaches that every reform movement parallels every other reform movement, and they all parallel the important reform movement of the 144,000. And if you're seeing this busy, busy artwork up here, that's what is represented in the different reform movements that we looked at as we identified that the way marks in each of these reform movements are the same. And just from doing that, without a reference to the seven thunders, just from identifying that every reform movement is the same, you can identify that the history of the Millerites, because it was a reform movement, <coughs> will parallel the history of the 144,000, because the history of the 144,000 is a reform movement. The 144,000 are those that are raised up from the time period that is represented as Laodicea. And the Laodiceans, we Laodiceans, are in need of a revival and a reformation. So when the 144,000 are developed, it's definitely a reform movement. Once you have this key, and the reason that we say that this is a key um, is because in the Millerite history, this is a, the Millerite history, in 1798, in fulfillment of Daniel 12, verse 4, and verse 9, at the time of the end, the book of Daniel would be unsealed. And that prophetic truth that would come to light in 1798 and progressively grow is what produced the Millerite experience. It was an unsealing of prophecy. And therefore, we're making the claim that the unsealing of the seven thunders is going to produce a similar experience, a parallel experience in the 144,000. And 
we identify that in Revelation 22, verse 11, which says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. But this is the close of human probation. And in verse 10, the verse that is right before the close of probation, it says, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. There comes a time, according to verses 10 and 11, just before the close of human probation, where the prophecy and revelation that has been sealed up is unsealed. And the only prophecy that is sealed up um, prior to the close of probation in the book of Revelation is the seven thunders. And therefore, when you understand that the seven thunders, based on Sister White's comment, represent that the Millerite history is repeated in the history of the 144,000, it gives you a key. If this is the first time that you're confronted with this material, you may think that it sounds valid, and it may sound interesting, but it's only when you've had time to take the key and begin to open the doors and prophecy that you realize that this truth, the fact that the Millerite history is repeated in the history of the 144,000, it brings to life passages of prophecy that we didn't even know there was more light in it's the best way to state it. Um, it brings the prophetic record alive. We, we pointed out this week that in verse 1 of Revelation 10, it says, I saw a mighty angel come down from heaven. Sister White tells us that this angel is Christ. She says, this is no less a personage than Jesus Christ. And when he comes down, he has a little book open in his hand. And Sister White tells us the little book is called Daniel. And he puts one foot upon the land, one foot upon the sea, and Sister White tells us the fact that he does this represents a worldwide message. So we identify that Christ came down in fulfillment of a time prophecy in Revelation 9, 14, and 15, identifying when the Ottoman Empire would collapse. Christ came down in Revelation 10, verse 1 through 3, on August 11, 1840. This is representing him coming down. And in verses... Um, 6 and 7, you have two verses that, verse 6 identifies when the end of time prophecy took place, which was October 22nd, 1844, and verse 7, you have the beginning of the seventh trumpet of Revelation, which is October 22nd, 1844. Therefore, from verses 1 through 7, you have the history of 1840 to 1844, which is the history that Sister White says is represented by the seven thunders. So the fact that the seven thunders is sealed up in this very passage of scripture, and that the truth it's teaching is the history where it is located, is consistent um, with how the Lord um, structures his truth. And then in verse 8, um, John, after he sees this and hears these things, He's told to go take the little book that is in Christ's hand, take the little book of Daniel, and he's told in verse 9, um, let, let's read verses 8, start with verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the scene upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, now, after he goes to, to Christ, he says, Give me the little book. Then Christ says to him, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but in but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I ate it, my belly was bitter. In Adventism, we correctly understood that um, John here is representing the Millerites. They take the book of Daniel, it's sweet in their mouth. This is another argument that the angel comes down on August 11, 1840, because the prophetic message that they were teaching prior to 1840 became sweet on August 11, 1840, because that's when the year day principle of Bible prophecy was confirmed. John is representing the Millerites who have seen the confirmation of the year day principle and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. He eats the book of Daniel, he eats the prophetic word, it's sweet in his mouth. But by the end of verse 10, it becomes bitter in the stomach, which takes you once again to October 22nd, 1844. So in verses 8 through 10, you're covering the same history that's in verses 1 through 7, and you're covering the same history that Sister White says the seven thunders represents. But 
John, we've always understood that this was the Millerite, but once you understand the seven thunders and you look a little bit closer at this passage, you realize, you realize that John is actually representing the 144,000. Because Sister White in history is clear that the Millerites did not know the experience that they were to go through from 1840 to 1844. The Lord providentially walked them through that history, but they did not know in advance what was going to take place in that history. But John here is told in advance, when you eat the little book, it will be sweet in your mouth, but it will turn bitter in your stomach. So John is here representing the 144,000, those people at the end of the world, that understand the Millerite history, but go through the same experience. So that, that is the message of Revelation 10, is that the Millerite history is repeated to the very better. And that's why verse 11 says, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, and nations, and tongues, and kings. After John illustrates this experience of sweet in the mouth, bitter in the stomach, he told, This ha has to happen again. It's going to happen again in the history of the 144,000. That's the message of Revelation 10. But remember, the chapter divisions are put in by men, and this prophecy continues right into chapter 11. And in verse 1, it says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. And... <clears throat> Whenever a prophet is being used, such as John is being used here, to illustrate a prophecy, then we're supposed to consider the, the circumstances that he's portrayed in and glean truth from it. And John has just reached October 22nd, 1844. He, the message has become bitter in his stomach. And then he's told to rise and measure the temple of God. And why did he need to do that? Because... Before October 22nd, 1844, the Millerites had a misconception about what the temple of God was. They thought the sanctuary was the earth. And the, one of the first works they had to do after the disappointment was come to understand what the sanctuary was. And that's what John is illustrating here. But then in verse 2, it continues on. It says, But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread, under, tread underfoot forty and two months. Now, I'm going to try to try to share something that, that I've come to understand in the past, and that is that when you see a prophet become part of the prophecy, such as John is doing here, that they always represent God's people at the end of the world. And I'm not sure of the next thing, but I think this is right, but I haven't tested every illustration of a prophet in the Bible yet, so I'm going to say it how I believe it, but I'm telling you, this part isn't fully tested. At this point, I would also add that when a prophet is being used in the prophecy, and he's illustrating God's people at the end of the world, he not only represents the Millerites, but he also represents the 144,000. I can show several times when prophets become part of the prophecy, and if you look closely at it, you will see that they are representing the Millerites, and at the same time, they are representing the 144,000. We've just shown that with John here in the eating of the little book. We've always understood this was the Millerites, but it is <coughs> technically correct that the Millerites did not know what was going to happen to them. And when John is told to go and take the little book and eat it, he's forewarned about what's going to happen. So he's both identifying the Millerites and the 144,000. And it is technically correct that after October 22nd, 1844, what the Millerites needed to do was understand the temple. They had a misunderstanding of the sanctuary. If everyone understands this, say amen. 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 Okay. But you can very easily see in verse 1 of Revelation 11 that John also is representing 144,000 for this reason. And some of you weren't here for some of these presentations. And most in Adventism um, are, are unfamiliar with the 2520 time prophecy. Um, some of you may have never heard about the 2520 until this evening, right now. But some of you listen to it a little bit. Um, just so we have a sense, 
How many of you are prepared to go out and give the, a Bible study on the 2520 time prophecy to a non-Adventist tomorrow afternoon? Please raise your hand. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Look around, brothers and sisters. Okay, so we're, I'm only doing that to tell you a couple things. That chart on the left and that chart on the right are both endorsed by God. We've read quotes where Sister White puts her endorsement, puts God's endorsement on both those charts. And both those charts have the 2520 time prophecy. And every Millerite preacher preached to 2520. Every Millerite preacher preached to 2520. And the chart on the left, the 1843 chart, is a symbol of what was taught between 1840 to 1844. So when Sister White says the seven thunders represent, represent the history, the delineation of events that transpired under the first and second angels' messages, she's saying the seven thunders represents the history of 1840 to 1844. And if you had to find a way to symbolize the history of 1840 to 1844, the best symbol of it is that chart, the 1843 chart, because all the truths that they were teaching Amen. and all the truths that produced the experience they went to through are represented on that chart. And Sister White says in early writings, page 74, that that chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered. And therefore, what I'm submitting to you is when Revelation 10, 4 says the seven thunders is sealed up, means that the history that is represented by the seven thunders, the history of 1840 to 1844, is no longer understood by God's people at the end of the world. And we must return to the old paths, to the foundations, to understand these truths in order to participate in the final work. Therefore, although many of you are unfamiliar with the 2520 time prophecy, I want to show something to you if I can. And we've been through it briefly already this week, so this will just be brief, so I can make one point possibly. The 2520 time prophecy is a punishment that was carried out against ancient Israel for their breaking the covenant with God. But ancient Israel was two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And it's a prophecy in Leviticus 26 that said, should Israel break the covenant, that the Lord would scatter them for 2,520 years. And in 723, the northern kingdom was carried into captivity for 2,520 years. And that time period ended in 1798. In the year 677, Manasseh, king of the southern kingdom, was carried to Babylon beginning that 2520 time prophecy. And that concluded in 1844. Between 1798 and 1844, you have 46 years. We've read a quote from the Great Controversy here this week where Sister White says the coming of the messenger of the covenant coming suddenly to his temple as identified in Malachi 3 is the same as Daniel 8.14 and the same event as Daniel 7.13. In other words, the messenger came to his covenant, come to his temple, came to his temple in Malachi 3 on October 22nd, 1844. And in John 2.20, Pharisees had just asked Christ for a sign, and in verse 19, he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up, and in verse 20 of John chapter 2, the Jew says, 46 years was this temple in building, and they were talking about the literal temple, but from 1798 to 1844, the spiritual temple was erected in order for Christ to move into the most holy place on October 22nd, 1844 in order for the messenger of the covenant, and Christ is the messenger of the covenant, to suddenly come to his temple on October 22nd, 1844. So, what I want you to see, and there's a lot more to say about this, but if you go back to Revelation 11, verse 1, when it says, to, uh, speaking of John, and there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angels stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them, there, them that worship therein, in the Millerite history, 
After October 22, 1844, the Millerites had to measure the sanctuary. They had to come to understand what the sanctuary was because they had an incorrect understanding of the temple. Amen. But at the end of the world, when John is representing 144,000, the temple that we have to measure is the history that took place from 1798 to 1844 when the spiritual temple was raised up. And that history is the history that is the seven thunders, and that history is the history that prefigures the reform movement of the 144,000. So what I'm saying is, is when you look at prophets in Bible prophecy, and they become part of the prophets itself, that they are illustrating God's people at the end of the world, both the Millerites and the 144,000. And the temple that John is saying that we have to measure is the one that was erected from 1798 to 1844 when the messenger of the covenant came suddenly to his temple. Turn with me, if you would, to Malachi chapter 3. Just so you haven't looked at that in the past. Chapter 3 of Malachi, verses 1, uh, 1 through 3, but probably I'll just read Verse 1. Now, the reason that we're reading this, how many are aware that in the great controversy, Sister White takes this passage and says it's the same event as Daniel 8, 14, and Daniel 7, 13, and the parable of the wedding, she says. They're all the same event. They were all fulfilled on October 22, 1844. So in verse 1 of Malachi 3, it says, Behold, I will send the messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. This messenger that prepared the way for Christ to come to his temple on October 22, 1844, was William Miller. That's why Sister White compares William Miller with John the Baptist. John the Baptist prepared the way for the Lord when he came here in person. But this is fulfilled on October 22, 1844. So when it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, that's William Miller. And the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. On October 22nd, 1844, the Lord entered into covenant with modern Israel. He raised up Israel for only the second time. He can run the word denominated people. Ancient Israel was God's denominated people, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church was God's denominated people, and that's the only two groups that Ellen White ever calls God's denominated people. Sister White never calls the Christian church from the stoning of Stephen until 1844 the denominated people of God. That was the Christian church. Modern Israel was raised up on October 22, 1844, and when I say raised up, I mean brought to life. Turn with me, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37, all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. And the prophets, when they become part of the prophecy, are illustrating God's people at the end of the world, both 144,000 and the Millerites. And I submit to you that the first part of Ezekiel 37, the Lord is identifying how he raises his people to life, how he raised up the Millerites and entered into the covenant with modern Israel on October 22nd, 1844. Verse 1 of Ezekiel 37 says, And the hand of the Lord was upon me, and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of a valley which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Now, if you're not familiar with this, let me just tell you straightforward that Sister White says this valley of dry bones is the Seventh-day Adventist church. She says it one time just directly. Um, and this is a description on how the Seventh-day Adventist church gets brought to life at the end of the world. It's also a description on how um, the Lord raised up modern Israel on October 22, 1844, because the Millerite history is repeated when the 144,000 are raised up. And if you're careful now, in the, the scenario that Ezekiel participates in, the way that the Lord brings his people back to life is very clearly illustrated through prophecy. 
Verse 3, it says, And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say to them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and cause you to come up out of your graves, and bring you up into the land of Israel. Sister White says the same thing. She says in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 122, that our greatest need, what, we, what should be our first work, is to seek for a revival. And on page 128, seven pages later, in the same passage, she says a revival represents a renewal of spiritual life. If our greatest need is for a revival, then it means that we're spiritually dead. And in Testimonies to Ministers, page 113, she says, when we understand the books of Daniel and Revelation as we should, there will be seen among us a great revival. The Lord's method of bringing his people to life both in the Millerite history and here at the end of the world is prophecy. And let me read in the Ellen White Bible Commentary um, the, let me read a comment on this from Sister White. This is from Review and Herald, January 17, 1893. Um, and she's just described how these bones represent the people in the world, but she's there's other places where she says it represents the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And if you're going to stumble over that, you need to remember that Sister White says the Laodicean message represents the whole world, and she says it represents the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's not, a, it's not a contradiction, but as she's switching gears here in this passage, directing this to Adventism, she says this. But not only does this simile of the dry bones apply to the world, but also to those who have been blessed with great light. For they are also like the skeletons of the valley. They have a form of man, the framework of a body, but they have not the spiritual life. But the parable does not leave the dry bones merely knit together into forms of men. For it is not enough that there is symmetry of limb and feature. The breath of life must vivify the bodies that they may stand upright and spring into activity. These bones represent the house of Israel, the church of God. And the hope of the church is the divine influence of the Holy Spirit. The Lord must breathe upon the dry bones that they may live. Here's, I'm backing up with the same quote, but backing up. Yet nevertheless, yet nevertheless, the word of prophecy must be spoken even to those who are like the dry bones in the valley. We are in no wise to be deterred from fulfilling our commission by the listlessness, the dullness, the lack of spiritual preparation. We are to preach the word of life. She just called the word of prophecy the word of life. We are to preach the word of life to those whom we may judge to be hopeless subjects as though they were in their graves. Though they may seem unwilling to hear or to receive the light of truth, without questioning or wavering, we are to do our part. We are to repeat the message, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. It is not the human agent that is to inspire with life. The Lord God of Israel will do that part, quickening the lifeless spiritual nature into activity. The breath of the Lord of hosts must enter into the lifeless bodies. In the judgment, when all secrets are laid bare, it will be known that the voice of God spoke through the human agent and aroused the torpid conscience, and stirred the lifeless faculties, and moved sinners to repentance, contrition, and forsaking of sin. Brothers and sisters, the prophetic word is the word of life. It is the word that awakens the conscience, stirs the lifeless faculties, and moves the sinners to repentance, and contrition, and 
the forsaking of sin. Amen. Amen. The prophetic word is the tool the Lord uses to raise his people to life. And prophecy is built upon the principle of repeat and enlarge. And after you look closely at Ezekiel 37, and you realize that Ezekiel has just become part of the illustration of how God brings his people at the end of the world to life, he's going to go back over that ground. In verse 15, he's going to repeat and enlarge upon this truth. In verse 15 it says, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel his companions, and take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the, and for all the house of Israel his companions, and join them one to another in one stick, and they shall become one in thy hand. Now, brothers and sisters, you, you can't understand this passage of the two sticks correctly if you don't understand both 25-20 time prophecies. Amen. And the understanding of both 25-20 time prophecies is something that's only been recognized in the past three years, years or so. And what, what Ezekiel is being told to do here is take a stick for the northern kingdom that had a time prophecy of punishment for 2,520 years, and a stick for the southern kingdom that had the same time prophecy, and join them into one stick. And it continues on, verse 18, And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Comes a point in time when the watchmen on the wall of Zion are supposed to teach what it means that these two sticks are joined together. That's what that verse is saying. When it comes a time that they're going to ask you, what does it mean that these two sticks are joined together? Well, it means it means that we're now understanding both 25-20 time prophecies, which are the bookends of 1798 to 1844, which identify the 46-year time period when the spiritual temple was raised up, that we have to take the read and measure in order to understand that history in order to recognize when that history is repeated. In verse 19 it says, saying to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribe of Israel his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. And the sticks wherein thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And saying to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they are gone, that's the northern kingdom, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into kingdoms any more at all. And the promise was is that the Lord was going to raise up modern Israel at the end of the scattering time, and it, there would not be two kingdoms in Israel any longer. They would be one kingdom. And that was accomplished on October 22, 1844, when, when the Lord raised up modern Israel. Amen. Notice verse 24, it says, And David my servant shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments, and observe my statutes, and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant. Verse 26. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and set my, set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord that I, the Lord, who sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Amen. October 22, 1844, the Lord entered into covenant with modern Israel, just as he entered into covenant with ancient Israel at Sinai. But brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, the covenant that was established at Sinai in the time period when they just come out of Egypt and when Moses received the law, that covenant was repeated just before they went into the promised land. Take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 29, and you'll see that that covenant was repeated just before they went into the promised land. And there's a, there is in that an illustration of the fact that on October 22, 1844, the Lord entered into covenant with modern Israel, but there would be a scattering that takes place in modern Israel. We dealt with that here this week. 
and scattering that's illustrated in William Miller's dream. And when it comes time for the dirt brush man in William Miller's name, the dream, which is Christ, according to Sister White, to sweep away the false teachings that have accumulated in Adventism and reestablish the foundation of truths, then the Lord will come to enter into covenant with those people during that time period that are standing just before we enter into the promised land. And that's what Deuteronomy 29 is paralleling. When we're talking about the Lord unsealing the seven thunders here at the end of the world, we're identifying the time period when Laodicea is being offered to enter into a covenant with the Lord their God. Now, if you go to Zechariah, I want to give you another illustration of prophets becoming part of the prophecy. I hope that you're familiar, if you've read Prophets and Kings, with the fact that in Zechariah chapter 3, in the story of Joshua and the angel, it sits quite plainly says that the story of Joshua and the angel in Zechariah chapter 3 is illustrating the time period of the investigative judgment from October 22nd, 1844, until Christ um, finishes that work. In letter 360, 1906, in the study Bible, Sister White says this, It has been shown me that the experience recorded in the third chapter of Zechariah is now being acted over and will continue to be while men, making profession of cleanness, refuse to humble the heart and confess their sin. Sister White is placing Zechariah chapter 3 in our day and age. The places she's specific. It's identifying the work in the investigative judgment. All I'm saying at this point is that Zechariah has been specifically identified by Sister White as being a passage in Scripture that deals with Adventism at the end of the world. Um, let's start in chapter 1. I'm going to leave some of this off because of time. Let's start in verse 12. Verse 12 of chapter 1 of Zechariah, knowing that, that chapter 3, we should know this is Seventh-day Adventist, is the investigative judgment. Verse 12 of chapter 1, it says, the angel of the Lord, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years? What's the three score and ten years? It's the seven years of captivity of Israel and Babylon and brothers and sisters. In the three decrees, the 70 years of captivity, when they were in Babylon over here, it introduces the history of the three decrees, the first decree, the second decree, the third decree, followed by Nehemiah's decree. What am I saying? I'm saying that we've already established that this history that Zechariah is referring to about their captivity for 70 years lines up perfectly with when the three angels' messages first second and third came into history to be followed by the fourth. In other words, this passage in Zechariah is being placed in the terminology of the three decrees in Nehemiah and the coming out of Babylon, but it's absolutely airtight that it's a parallel to the Millerite history. Right? We've shown that this week. Verse 13, And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words, so that the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus said the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great jealousy. He's je jealous for Jerusalem because Jerusalem has been destroyed, and he's going to reestablish Jerusalem. And on October 22nd, 1844, he reestablished modern Jerusalem, as well as when he rebuilt Jerusalem after they came out of Babylon. That's the context of this passage. Verse 15, I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Who's, who's the heathen that helped forward the affliction? That's the heathen that the Lord used to scatter and punish Israel and to take them into battle. All right? Verse 16, Therefore this saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched upon Jerusalem. What's it mean that you're going to stretch a line upon Jerusalem? He's a judge. Don't get that detail. Have we already read that tonight? Yeah. Revelation 11, verse 1. John is given a read and going to go major Jerusalem. All the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. 
Zechariah here is saying that there's going to come a time when John the Revelator is going to measure Jerusalem. And we already know that's October 22nd, 1844. And he's going to measure it again at the end of the world in the time period when 144,000 are raised up. This is a promise that is directly to you and I here at the end of the world. Verse 16, Therefore thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Brothers and sisters, when you identify the 225-20 time prophecies, one ending in 1798 and one ending in 1844, and then you begin to get a very detailed presentation of what history took place from 1798 to 1844 and what the implications of that history being repeated at the end of the world is, what you're doing is you're stretching a line upon Jerusalem. You're measuring it. You're investigating it. You're coming to understand the details of it. That's the work that we do at the end of the world, if we're going to be among the 144,000 and there is no other calling for Seventh-day Adventists, we've been told to strive to be among the 144,000. Verse 17, cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, my cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Then I lifted up mine eyes, and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Jerusalem, Israel, and Jerusalem, Judah, Jer Israel, and Jerusalem. What four horns? What's a horn in Bible prophecy? It's a power. What four powers did the Lord use to scatter ancient Israel? Well, according to Daniel chapter 8, he begins in the Medes and the Persians, but the Babylonians had already carried them into captivity. It's Babylon, it's Medo-Persia, it's Greece, and it's Rome are the four horns that the Lord used to scatter God's people. And what's the scattering in Bible prophecy? It's the 2520. Verse 20, And the Lord showed me four carpenters. And I said, what come these to do? And he spake, saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no none did lift up his head. But these, these four carpenters, by the way, who was a carpenter? This is the most Christ. But these are come to fray them, and cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. What are the four carpenters that chastise? The heathen powers. But it's just, it's the four angels that this message is built upon. The three angels' message arriving in the middle of that history and the fourth at the end of the world. Yeah. Verse 1 I lifted up my eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Now, brothers and sisters, all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. They're all telling the same story. And we already read earlier tonight that in Revelation 11, verse 1, John is told to get a read and go measure Jerusalem. And now we see Ze Zechariah, and he sees someone measuring Jerusalem. Who is it that Zechariah sees? He sees John. He sees the Millerites. He sees the 144,000 investigating what the sanctuary is in both histories. Are you following the logic, or am I getting too metaphorical for it? We all seem to have it. a blank look. Because it's the end of the week? No. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. I lifted up my eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said, To measure Jerusalem, and to see what the breadth thereof, and what the length, what is the length thereof. And behold, an angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went to meet him, and he said unto me, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will bring unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. Isn't that what we understand? That Seventh-day Adventists, they're going to be on the wall, which Sister White says represents the, the law of God, and they're going to give the last warning message to the world, which is a message of God's glory, which is a message of his character. Amen. This is a message of Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world. Notice verse 6. Amen. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north. What was the, the climatic message in the Millerite history? Come out of Babylon. What's our message? Come out of Babylon. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the north, saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, saith the Lord. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. 
Amen. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, after glory hath he sent me into the nations which spoiled you, for he has he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. For behold, I will shake my hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord, and many the nations shall be joined the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee, and the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion, in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. When was it that the Lord raised up out of his holy habitation and moved into the most holy place? October 22nd, 1844. Brothers and sisters, this is a message for Adventists and folk in their lives. And I think more than anything, it's chapter 3. And chapter 3, Sister Wright plainly says, chapter 3 is representing the investigative judgment that began on October 22nd, 1844. She says that chapter 3 is especially dealing with the final work, the very closing work in the investigative judgment, and then you come to chapter 4. And in chapter 4 it says, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me, as a man is wakened out of his sleep. I've asked this many times, and you've probably all heard this question, and it will seem very redundant. But why do we have to know that Zechariah was sleepy? Why is that in there? Because the Lord wants us to understand it. He's sleepy. Verse 2, And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes of the seven lamps which are on top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other on the left side of the thereof. Now, brothers and sisters, Zechariah is a prophet that is doing his ministry in the time period when they are rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple. Certainly a prophet that is ministering when they're rebuilding the temple knows what the seven-branched golden candlestick is, right? We all do. But he doesn't. Verse 4. So I answered and spake unto the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord, I don't know what the furnishing of the sanctuary is. Who is it that awoke at the midnight cry and then recognized that they didn't know what the sanctuary was all about? It's the Millerites. The Millerites. That's why on October 23rd, John's given the command, go measure the temple. You haven't understood the sanctuary correctly. You didn't understand any part of it. And Zechariah is representing the same people that John's representing. They wake up at the midnight cry. And they come to October 22nd, 1844 and realize they don't understand the sanctuary. Verse and the, and the angel emphasizes it in verse 5. Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. Now, brothers and sisters, <coughs> Zerubbabel, you ever looked up what the meaning of Zerubbabel means? It means offspring of Babylon, or you might say, out of Babylon. So it springs out of Babylon. Zerubbabel's name represents out of Babylon, and this is a promise that Zerubbabel, who was a governor during the rebuilding of the temple, that he would lay the foundation to the temple, and he would also put the capstone, the finishing piece on the temple, and Sister White says that was fulfilled. But in his name, we have the second and the fourth angel's message, which are out of Babylon. And it's teaching that when the spiritual temple is erected at the end of the world, that in the history of the midnight cry, the empowerment of the second angel's message, the foundation stone will be laid. Amen. But in the Revelation 18's angel, which is also to love of all, come out of Babylon, the capstone will be put on. Brothers and sisters, Zechariah is a message that is specific to Adventism at the end of the world. 
Verse 10 is one of the most significant verses. This is what we've been dealing with this week much. It says, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Remember when they came out of Babylon and they built the temple? Remember that some of the elders that had seen the original temple, what did they do? They wept. They wept. And that wasn't, that wasn't good. It wasn't good. The beginnings of building that temple, the beginning work, was the spot. What was the beginning work of building the temple at the end of the world? It was the Millerite movement. And this passage says that at the end of the world, the foundations of Adventism, the history of 1840 to 1844, and what transpired there is going to be despised. And this is in agreement with what Jeremiah says that when he, he calls us to return to the old past, what does the, what does the other side say? We will not walk therein. The foundations of Adventism will be despised. But those who see it, they will rejoice because they will see Zerubbabel with those seven, which are the eyes of the Lord. And then verse 11 it says, Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knows not what thou what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. What are the two anointed ones, the two olive trees? The Old and New Testament. Now, brothers and sisters, when a prophet is used, and this is where this is the point I was trying to set up for tomorrow. When a prophet is used to illustrate God's people at the end of the world, he's used to illustrate the Millerites and the 144,000. That's the key that the seven thunders illustrate for us. That history is repeated. And when, when Zechariah wakes up, and clearly in the Millerite history, he doesn't understand what the sanctuary is. He represents the Millerites, but we understand what the sanctuary is, right? Unless we don't understand that there was a temple raised up from 1798 to 1844 when the 225-20 time prophecy is completed. And if we don't understand that, then we need to take the measuring rod and figure that out. So there's a double lesson in here. But, those of you that were here, when we did Luke 21, there were signs for the Millerite movement, the falling of the stars in the dark day, the distress of nations, which was the, the work of Islam, bringing warfare in the world until they were restrained. That was their sign. We looked at that. And it says, this generation shall not pass until Christ comes in the clouds. And he did. October 22nd, 1844, and according to Daniel 7.13, when Christ came into the ancient of days, he came into the clouds of heaven. So we pointed out that our sign, according to Christ in Luke 21, is the budding trees of spring. We read a comment from the great controversy where Sister White says, Christ pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring. And what is it that causes the trees to bud in the spring? It's the latter rain. It's the latter rain. And I would submit to you that this is what Adventism does not understand at the end of the world. They don't understand their son. They don't understand what the latter rain is. And I'll tell you something that usually challenges people. Do you know that Sister White correctly teaches and the Bible agrees that the latter rain are the messengers in the Bible? You ever heard that? Don't we think the latter rain is something that's poured out that empowers us to, to cast out demons and perform miracles and do all these wonderful things that took place at Pentecost? That will happen. But notice what Sister White says in Great Controversy 341. To John were open scenes of deep and thrilling interest in the experience of the church. She saw the position, dangers, conflicts, and final deliverance of the people of God. And notice this next sentence. He records the closing messages which are to ripen the harvest of the earth. What ripens the harvest? The latter rain. The latter rain. 
the messages, the prophetic messages in the book of Revelation is the latter rain. That's why when when Zechariah wakes up and he says, what's this seven-branched candlestick? And he's representing the Millerites. <coughs> and the angel says, you don't know what these are? And he says, no. What's the next verse? Because that next verse is identifying something that's misunderstood. What's misunderstood about the seven-branched candlestick that you and I have to understand at the end of the world? Not by my, not by power, but by my spirit, he says the Lord. It's not the furnishing of the sanctuary. It's that that, that candlestick represents the work of the Holy Spirit. And what's needed in that work is the two branches that carry the golden oil, which are the messages. Notice this from Review and Herald, July 20th, 1897. The anointed one standing by the Lord of the whole earth had the position once given to Satan as covering cherub. He just said that this was Old New Testament. And she's saying the two old anointed ones are the covering cherubs. By the holy being surrounding his throne, the Lord keeps up constant communication with the inhabitants of the earth. The golden oil represents the grace with which God keeps the lamps of believers supplied, that they shall not flicker and go out. Were it not that this holy oil is poured from heaven in the messages of God's Spirit, the agencies of evil would have entire control over man. Now notice this next sentence. God is dishonored when we do not receive the communications which he sends us. Thus we refuse the golden oil which he would pour into our souls to be communicated to those in darkness. When the call shall come, behold the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him those who have not received the holy oil. Or, when the call shall come, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him, those who have not received the messages in the book of Revelation that are to ripen earth's harvest, who have not cherished the grace of Christ in their hearts, will find, like the foolish virgins, that they are not ready to meet their Lord. They have not in themselves the power to obtain oil, and their lives are wrecked. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is accomplished through the prophetic message that is opened up to God's people at the end of time by the line of the tribe of Judah as the unsealed prophecies that have been covered up through the reception of tradition and customs and human teachings that have been handed down from generation to generation. So, out of time. What I was hoping to show this evening, I don't know that I pulled it off, is that when a prophet chooses to Bible prophecy, he's illustrating God's people at the end of the world, both the Millerites and the 144,000. And the things that the Millerites had to understand about the sanctuary are paralleling what we have to understand, but it's different. We know the furnishings of the sanctuary. We have libraries full of teachings on the furnishing of the sanctuary. What we don't know is the history of 1798 to 1844 where the Lord raised up spiritual Israel and entered into covenant with them and made him made them his covenant people. And the story of his covenant people has been illustrated with ancient Israel. And the Lord entered into covenant with ancient Israel immediately after they came out of Egypt. But the Lord re-entered into covenant with them again in Deuteronomy 29 just before they went into the promised land. And he enters into covenant with the Millerites in 1844 at the end of the scattering time. And he enters into covenant with the 144,000 at the end of the scattering time. And those of you who are here this week, you know that the scattering time is the scattering of William Miller's dream. And what the scattering represents for us here at the end of the world is that the truth, the foundational truths that were established by the Millerites have been buried through the history of Adventism, and the Lord is now reacquainting his people with it. Therefore, the Lord is now seeking to enter into covenant with his modern Israel, that they may go in and take the land. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, if you're getting the essence of this message this week, and you, as I, 
would like to be one of those that enters into that covenant with the Lord here at the end of the world. Please stand. I'll make a public testimony. Heavenly Father, we thank you for <clears throat> giving us eyes to see and ears to hear and recognize that you're now seeking to bring the dry bones of Adventism to life and fit us up for finishing this work that we might be done with this world of sin. We know that we have things to change, but we know that you have more than enough power to accomplish that, and that your love is more willing to do that for us than we are to give good gifts to our children. We thank you for revealing these truths about how willing you are, that we are stubborn and stiff-necked people. Above all others in history, we are the Laodiceans, we think everything's all right, but everything's all wrong. So we give you permission to do what it takes in our individual lives to break through that hard heart and that calloused mind that we'll follow through in the commitment we just made. You know me. And surrender at the foot of the cross to those idols and take up the work of being the type of student of prophecy that recognize the spirit that you're pouring out right now through the messages you've recorded in your word. Thank you for the Sabbath that is here, and as we travel home this Amen. evening, we ask for protection. We ask for rest tonight so we can participate wherever we may have come tomorrow and be blessed by you once again in worship services. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.